My name is Morgan Brown. As I said, I'm the caregiver specialist with Baltimore County Department of Aging. Today, we're going to be going over some tips and resources for caregivers to prepare for natural disasters. And without further ado, let's get started. Uh, did you know that as a family caregiver, you are one of 53 million Americans caring for someone who is an older adult or living with a disability? In many cases, you might be the only one attending to the daily needs of your loved one, a dear neighbor, or even a child with advanced health needs. Those that are in your care depend on you for their safety and well being, especially during emergencies and instances like natural disasters. So whether you're a caregiver that's near or long distance, there are some steps that you can take to protect your care partner and reduce the amount of loss and frustration if a natural disaster were to affect your area of residence. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, otherwise known as FEMA, and the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers graciously created this disaster preparedness guide that I'm going to be going over with you all today to help you navigate challenges that may arise when disasters strike. Okay, so I want you guys just to take a look at some of the pictures um, on the screen if you're able to. Um, some natural disasters that have occurred, and as you can see, extreme, extreme um, damage has been done uh, to these areas. Um, according to FEMA, between the years of 1953 and 2019, Maryland declared 34 major disasters of which floods and hurricanes occurred the most. And if you think about it, that's almost one uh, or once every other year. In 2016, Ellicott City, Maryland experienced torrential rain, which brought eight inches of rain in four hours. And in 2018, another eight inches, but in half that time. Uh, damage from these floods included hundreds of cars being washed away, fatalities, and historic buildings that were damaged or destroyed. This is another slide of, um, of some natural disasters. Um, can you think about where you were during Hurricane Isabel in 2003, maybe Hurricane Irene in 2011, Hurricane Sandy in 2012, or what about Snowmageddon in the winter of 2010 when Baltimore was hit with two big snowstorms in five days, totaling 50 inches of snow? So a disaster is um, described as a large community-wide geological scale event that brings great damage, loss, or destruction. Disaster preparedness is a set of measures that is taken and advanced by a government. And emergency management is a way to protect individuals and families by coordinating and integrating all activities necessary to build, sustain, and improve the capability to mitigate against, prevent, protect, prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters. Some common natural disasters um, that occur in Maryland, um, we have floods, thunderstorms are pretty common, especially in the summertime. Uh, we are hit with winter storms, power outages, and extreme heat. All right, so next we're going to go into the steps for emergency preparedness. The first is identify barriers and risks. And in this step, you identify common challenges you face as a family caregiver and strategies for overcoming them, either with your care recipient, with a support network, if you. But this step will enable you to understand the various obstacles that you may face when getting your care partner ready for a disaster. Um, and some of the things that you might want to consider are mobility issues, if you have limited funds and resources, or maybe, you know, the medical needs that you or and, and or your care partner might have. Um, the second step would be learning and connecting, and the third step would be making a plan. So we're going to go over each of these um, in one second. So for identifying barriers and risks, some things that you might want to go over with your care partner or the care recipient are asking questions like, what help does your care partner require for personal care? Uh, what assistive technology do they use to meet their daily needs? And what methods of transportation do they rely on? 
with your support network that could be someone like a brother, a sister, maybe you know you have a group of siblings, it could be uh, a religious community or church community. Uh, that's what your support network entails. Uh, but you might want to ask questions. Does the care recipient use assistive devices? Do they have interpreters or do they speak a different language that might not be common in the community? You want to ask something like, how do I inform first responders about unique communication needs of the care partner? And what is the role of the support network in helping your care recipient with grocery shopping, paying bills, all of those um, small details and things that we do on the day to day basis? But what are your role in those things as a part of the support network? As a solo caregiver, you could also be asking yourself, do I fully understand the medications and the equipments of the person that you're caring for? Um, do you know how often they have to take the medications? Do you know how to operate and navigate their assistive technology if they have any? Do they have spare assistive technology? So maybe the person you're caring for has you know, a hearing aid, or maybe they have vision loss of some sort and they might need, or they have extra sets of glasses. Do you know where those things are located? Um, you know, do you need to refill any type of prescription? Can they actually see out of the spare glasses that they have? You know, those are some of the things that you're gonna need to identify first and foremost. You also wanna see what are your limitations as a solo caregiver? Um, as a caregiver, you know that you cannot do it all on your own, uh, but especially if you're isolated, if you're living in a different state, um, you might not have a support network. You want to be realistic about what your limitations are uh, so you can provide the best care for your care recipient. Um, and do you know things like who provides medical care for your care recipient? Do you know their doctors? Do you know the doctor's numbers? Do you know the locations? All of those things would be important when you're learning how to care for your partner and assess these things, I'm sorry, access these things during a natural disaster. Okay, so now on to learning and connecting. In this step, you establish relationships with emergency services and identify community resources to help make your plan. You can learn and connect with your care partner or your support network if you have one. And if you are a solo caregiver, now is the time to start making connections and finding all the necessary supports. Um, in this step, you really want to focus on strengthening your community ties and ensuring that the resources that you need are readily available and accessible during the time of a disaster. So um, during this step, you want to ask your care partner things um, or go over with them and say something along the lines of, I'd like to talk about disaster preparedness and what that means to me and you. With your support network, you could address the conversation and say something like, I'd like to talk about disaster preparedness and how we can work together to make sure your care recipient, whether that be a mom, a dad, an uncle, a neighbor, um, you wanna talk about how you can prepare in the event of an emergency. Um, you also wanna ask what resources of one another's can we leverage to ensure that care recipient is taken care of. So maybe if it's a group of siblings, maybe you have a truck and maybe your truck is able to, um, to transport your loved one's wheelchair or other assistive technology back and forth. Maybe your brother or sister has a generator where you might not have one. So let's just say your care partner um, is on oxygen. If you could get your care partner to this other sibling's house who has a generator and a natural disaster, these are some of the things you want to start brainstorming to figure out how to work as a team to support your care recipient during a natural disaster. And if you are a solo caregiver, you really need to see and assess what additional help you would need to ensure that you and your care partner are prepared during a natural disaster. So next on this slide, um, I'm not sure if any other people have joined, but I did say in the beginning that I will gladly send out this PowerPoint. I do have some links on here to some databases and websites. So if you all are interested in it, I can certainly send that out at the end. Um, this particular slide, we're talking about medications, prescriptions, and medical care. Each state has different laws that authorize pharmacies and pharmacists to 
refill prescriptions early in the event of uh, a natural disaster. So you can familiarize yourself with these laws in your state by going to this link um, listed below. And you also want to be prepared to locate pharmacies and healthcare facilities during and after a disaster. So if you go to this link, um, you can see the operating status of the healthcare facilities in your area if they are impacted by a natural disaster. Some other caregiver resources. Um, if your care recipient has specialized equipment or devices, include these in your preparedness plan um, and know that there are options to replace or get support if needed after a disaster. Um, this next link is to the Pass It On Center, which is a national resource that reuses assistive technology and durable medical equipment. Um, so definitely take a look at this link below if that's something that you are interested in or maybe you can donate something to this. Um, to this resource, that would definitely be great if you do have extras, um, you know, available from your care partner, maybe in the past. Um, the next is the Emergency Prescription Assistance Program, otherwise known as EPAP. It helps people in a federally identified disaster area who don't have health insurance. It helps them get prescription drugs, vaccinations, medical supplies, and equipment that they might need. Um, and so, again, you can learn more about this program at this link listed below. Power restoration, definitely a big one. Um, if we are dealing with uh, thunderstorms, sometimes snowstorms, extreme heat, all of those different things that can cause um, the power to go out in your area, um, you want to make sure that you know if your care recipient relies on electricity for their medical devices or assistive technology. Um, you might be able to reach out to your electricity supplier to see if they have programs and resources to help you. Sometimes you can get on a priority list to be one of the you know first people that they're helping restore power to in the you know event that they're using oxygen or something else that requires electricity. Um, and also transportation, uh, you really need to make sure that you understand not only the transportation that your care partner utilizes, but you as well, um, particularly if an evacuation is necessary. So um, the local area agency on aging is a resource that can connect you with that information and that resource is listed below in this slide as well. And I did forget to mention that sometimes your um, electricity provider, sometimes they can have, um, they can provide you with resources that can get you backup batteries or, you know, additional batteries for some of the medical equipment that your care recipient might need. Um, so that's definitely something that you uh, want to keep in mind. Establishing partnerships with emergency services. So in this link below, you can sign yourself and your care partner up for emergency alerts. So you're always up to date with, um, you know, the current weather, current disasters. If they're tracking them, you know, something is on the way. Definitely make sure that you sign up for alerts. You can attend community preparedness fairs or fire station open houses um, to meet and connect with first responders that are in your area. You want to create a checklist of emergency numbers and contacts. So, again, all of the people that are in your support network, your doctor's offices, um, the pharmacy, um, all of the people that would be able to help you out along the way, or even, you know, in this day and age, we can communicate with our loved ones often, but we might not have their phone numbers memorized. So, it still would be smart and, and wise to have everyone's phone number listed on these emergency contact sheets, just because you never know. Um, you can also create a profile that can help first responders learn about the needs of your care recipient by signing up at smart911.com, and I have also linked that in this PowerPoint. All right, so now that you've done um, a risk assessment and you'd identified the resources available to you and your care recipient, you're ready to make a 
disaster emergency plan. So this includes building a disaster preparedness kit and preparing for evacuation or disaster sheltering scenarios. While planning, you'll wanna include your care recipient when possible, as well as your family and friends and any support networks that you may have developed. You wanna be honest and open about the process and the role that you are willing and able to play. So you wanna um, you know, engage with your, your care recipient um, but also the people that are in your support network, if you have one, you wanna discuss the different roles and responsibilities and just make sure that everyone is on the same page with who is responsible for what. Um, you also wanna identify different tasks that your care recipient might be able to handle. Um, not only is this gonna take the load off of you, but it's also gonna help your care recipient feel like they are a part of their care planning. And, and that's important for people who um, might have other limitations. So they might be able to do things like checking the food expiration dates, uh, ensuring that their equipment is functioning properly. Uh, maybe they can go through their uh, their first aid kits, throw out the expired things, make lists of things that um, that need to be replaced. All of these things are so simple, but can definitely make sure that your care recipient feels involved in the process. So this slide just goes over some of the things that you might wanna consider putting in your emergency kit. Um, of course, you wanna have water for several days. Um, you wanna account for drinking, but also for sanitation purposes. You wanna have your non-perishable food items. Maybe you wanna have family photos or some family mementos um, in the event that you need to evacuate. You wanna have some flashlights, extra batteries, first aid kits, um, maybe a whistle to you know signal for help. You wanna have copies of your care partner's will or trust, copies of your homeowner's or rental insurance and car insurance. You wanna make sure that your personal documents such as your ID are up to date. Um, post COVID, I feel like everyone um, knows where to locate um, masks of any sort. So if you have uh, a box of masks, you might wanna put that um, in your kit as well. Um, you may consider can openers, local maps, um, maybe an extra cell phone charger. Um, if you have a service animal, you might wanna include extra pet food and supplies. Of course, um, medications. And as I stated in the last slide, a list of the medications and doctor's phone numbers um, for your care recipient. So a little more about preparing for service animals. Um, make sure that you um, also have identification for the animal. So maybe that's just like an extra dog tag or an extra collar, um, an extra leash, things like that. Um, in an emergency, service animals must be allowed to come inside of shelters or clinics. Um, but if for some reason you don't want to or don't feel comfortable or can't take your service animal with you, make sure that you do have a plan for someone to care for uh, your pet if you cannot take them along with you. Um, so maybe that means that if you have a loved one that could care for your animal during this time, if you have to evacuate, maybe you wanna have um, extra food bowls, extra bag of food, again, any medication um, that your animals might need. Those are some things that you wanna take into consideration. All right, so leaving, sheltering, and staying inside. Um, as a caregiver, it's essential to be prepared for evacuation scenarios because in some situations, leaving your current location for a safer location um, is the best action for you and your care recipient. So you wanna make sure that you're planning an evacuation route ahead of time. You wanna practice this route with your care recipient to reduce any stress and uncertainty, um, you know, in the event that there wasn't a, a disaster. And if for some reason your care recipient is not able to leave out of the house or you can't practice this route with them, you can do things like taking pictures or having a map ready for them so they know what the evacuation route is. And if you do have a backup route, make sure that you include that as well. Um, sheltering, meaning 
being in a local shelter, um, you want to learn about all of the different accommodations that the shelter might have and really recognizing that um, in congregate shelters, you might be sharing living spaces, restrooms. So you want to go over that with your care partner if that might negatively affect them in any way. Um, you want to go over all of those different possibilities in the event that they do have to be in a congregate shelter. Okay, and then lastly, staying inside. Um, you know, sometimes it's the safest option to shelter in place in a vehicle or a car until the natural disaster um, has passed. So maybe consider getting um, an emergency kit that you can keep in your car as well. I know sometimes for winter storms, people like to keep kitty litter and extra blankets. Um, maybe some non perishable food, you can keep them in a little crate, maybe in the back of your trunk. Um, consider getting flares, maybe, um, you know, for safety in case you have to get out and, you know, change a tire or anything like that. Make sure that you have an additional emergency kit that you keep in your car because you just never know. And here are the references. Um, like I said, I got this information from the FEMA uh, FEMA guide. So if anyone is interested in diving a little bit deeper into some of the recommendations, um, the guide is great. They have a lot of links on there, a lot of different resources, checklists, and all of those things. So again, if anyone is interested, please feel free to let me know and I can send you the PowerPoint where you can locate the actual um, the actual guide if you're interested. Does anyone have any questions, thoughts, concerns? How, how does this differ than um, like preparing for somebody who's a senior, like an aged senior? What, what do you mean, like, how does it differ? What, could you elaborate a little bit more for me? Uh, well, I see similar similarities with uh, maybe uh, using a wheelchair or being mm -hmm. mobility bound. Mm -hmm. So there's caregiving involved in that. Right, so um, so like I said, the, um, the, the guide can go, there is a separate guide that is specifically catering to older adults. This one, um, not so much. It's really just a general overall thing, you know, as a caregiver, some considerations um, and things that you might want to uh, account for. But if you do want more information on that, if you're specifically caring for someone who is an older adult, I can send you um, a link to that as well. Like I said, there's a lot of different resources that are in the guide, so I can send you that as well. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, um, I will certainly send out the email. And if you guys have any other follow up questions, you could give me a call at 410 887 1663. Again, my name is Morgan Brown, the caregiver specialist for the caregiver support program. Um, and thank you all for attending. I hope that you were able to walk away with some um, helpful information or different things to consider as a caregiver.